let's move on to uh, lecture three. And uh, we are not going to do any thermodynamics in this lecture. Instead, we are going to talk about probabilities. And uh, it's very important to talk about probabilities in thermodynamics. As we have noticed uh, from uh, the first lecture, we are dealing with large number of particles. Uh, could be atoms, could be molecules, could be other particles. And uh, that means that clearly the reason why we can describe all those very large collection of particles and molecules, atoms, and so on and so forth, using functions, continuous functions like pressure, temperature, volume, and so on and so forth, means that um, there, is, there, is a, there is a connection between the particular uh, uh, description and the more uh, continuous uh, one. And that, that connection is probability. Uh, so we are going to talk about probability here uh, for the next half hour or so. First of all, uh, we are going to talk, talk about discrete probability distribution. So discrete probability distributions simply mean that we are working with a random variable, which can only take a set number of values. So that random variable is discrete. So for example, a discrete random variable, an example of that would be if you take a, a dice. So uh, there are six possibilities. So you have a discrete number. It could be one, two, three, four, five, six. And that would be a good uh, random variable, which would be the number of dots that you have on the face of the dice that you just rolled. Another example of that would be, of course, uh, using um, a coin. And you have only two possibilities. You have a head or tail. Uh, and uh, of course, here, the random variable can only take two uh, values. So it's also a discrete probability distribution. In a few, uh, I mean, it's described by a uh, discrete probability distribution. Uh, later in this lecture, we'll talk about continuous probability distribution. An example of that would be, for example, the height of people in a classroom. So that can essentially take continuous uh, values um, between a minimum value and maximum value but not a discrete set of values. And another example is the temperature. Uh, the temperature of, of objects could be, for example, take different values. But uh, so that's what we are doing. For first, let's talk about discrete probability distribution. And the idea, of course, is that if each outcome is, uh, is, is possible, uh, and we have listed all the possible outcomes, and each of them have probability pi, probability of outcome of xi, then of course, we need to have the sum of the, all the probabilities to be one. So it is essentially, it means that if we perform the experiment, we are going to get a result, okay? So that's a very important pro uh, property of a probability distribution. Uh, we also like to calculate mean, which can also be called average or expected value. So these are synonymous, and these are and these va this is a weighting sum of the probability of, of each value. So basically what it says, uh, if I look at uh, what's on the on the slide right now, so the expectation value of x will be given by a weighted sum of the outcome of the experiment times its probability. Just to give you an idea, the expectation value in my in my um, in my experiment was a dice with six faces. The expectation value is that how many on average, how many dots on average will I get? Okay. So of course here, what you need to do. You see that if the probability, if it's an unloaded die, you know that each probability is one six. So you have one six times one plus one six times two plus one six times three plus one six times four, and so on and so forth. And then the expectation value is that value here. So for the coin, the coin we have half probability to have tail, high probability to be head. If we say that the tail is a value of one and head is a value of zero, for example, then of course the expectation value will be one half times zero plus one half times one, and of course the expectation value will be 0 0.5. Okay, so that's the idea of uh, the mean average and expected value. We also like to calculate the mean squared value of x. So basically, what we look is that what is the expectation value for x squared? Uh, it's going to become very important in a minute when we talk about variance. So basically, this is the expectation value of x squared, which is, of course, the value x squared times the probability of finding it. Okay, this is a very useful relationship that we are going to use over and over again. And in general, we can calculate the expectation value of any function. 
So we just show the function x squared, but we could, could do the expectation of any function of the random uh, variable. And that will be obtained by the formula there, which is, of course, the sum of the probability of finding that variable multiplied by the value of the function for that variable. OK, so that's uh, that's very good. So let's try to have an example other than the two, other than the two example I mentioned. Uh, suppose that you have a random variable and it can take values 0, 1 and 2. Uh, and then um, the value 0 is half probability. I mean, it's 50% probability and value, values 1 and 2 have 25% uh, probabilities. So this is what's written on the, on the graph on the right-hand side. You see that. So Px is the probability distribution function, okay, which is discrete in this case since the random variable is discrete. Good. Um, so let's, let's try to think a little bit uh, what we, we get from here. So of course, we can calculate the expectation value. The expectation value uh, would be, as I said, the value that we get times the probability. In this case, we get, get three quarters. So, so on average, uh, if you were performing this experiment many, 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 many times, on average, you would expect the value to be three quarters. So what's interesting, of course, about this value is that the expectation value is actually not a value that you can measure. Okay, It's the average value. So you see three quarter will never be measured because the only possible values that you can measure are zero, one, and two. So that, that's an important uh, note to make. And of course you can calculate the expectation value of X square. And uh, this is very similar to before, but instead of summing uh, uh, of, way, of using a weight X, we use a, a weight X square. And you get uh, uh, five uh, fourth. Uh, this is the expectation value of the square. This is what we obtain. Good. Now it's time to move to continuous probability distribution. Uh, this is very similar to what we had before, but instead the value x, so the random variable, can take continuous values, uh, which is any values, of course. Okay. So now the problem we have with this is that remember that one of the important things is that the sum of the probability should be equal to one. Now, if we have a, if we apply this blindly without thinking too much. We know that if it's a continuous probability distribution, we have an infinite number of values. So even if the probabilities were very small, they would still be finite. And summing an infinite number of values, which are finite, would, give, would make it impossible to be equal to 1. Remember, it has to be normalized so that the total probability is 1. So instead, for continuous probability distribution, we actually calculate the probability density, so px is a probability density, so that px times dx is a probability. So remember, density is always a probability per something, so in this case, per value of x. And therefore, px dx is a probability of finding the value between x and x plus dx. Okay, So that's very important to do that, because if you do not do this, you cannot normalize your, your function like you would do with the discrete values. And of course, if you do that, you can show that the total probability is equal to 1. And remember, now we integrate over all the values of x. So it's really the integrate of the probability times, times the, 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 basically the interval that I'm considering. Total probability is equal to, to, to x. And of course, we can calculate the mean value, which is, again, a weighted uh, integration of uh, x. Okay, Same as before, but we've replaced sums by integrals. And we can calculate, of course, all the other, other properties as shown in the previous slide. So let's have a look at an example of a continuous distribution. Uh, such a distribution is Gaussian. Gaussian is one of the favorite distribution in physics, uh, in fact, in, in, in science in general, just because uh, all the integrals that are involved uh, can be solved, most of them at least, can be solved analytically. Okay? And it's a very well behaved function too. So of course, the the way that the function looks like is like it's an exponential, uh, decaying exponential with an argument x square, which means that it's going to decay the same way for positive axis and and, and negative axis. As a reason why it's a symmetric function, of course. Okay, so that's good. All right. So this is a probability distribution. So the first thing that we want to do is to we want to calculate the expectation value of x. 
and the expectation value of x squared. So first of all, each time you deal with probability distribution, you have to think about normalization. So you have to make sure that the function is normalized. In other words, that the total probability is one. Okay, that is certainty, but not more. So for that, you integrate uh, the function, you integrate your, your distribution, and uh, you end up uh, integrating uh, the Gaussian, okay? And there are formulas, and the formulas are actually provided uh, at the back of the book, and I, I'm going to get back to, I'm going to get to this, to the slide that I created here with a formula here for, for the Gaussian. So obviously, you don't have to study those by heart. This, this part is part of a, of a list of, of formula. Uh, but you come here to this to this slide, and you know exactly uh, those integrals, which are exact. Exact. So I get back here. So we we saw that we can we see that we can calculate normalization. We go to the formula, and we obtain the value there, and that gives us, of course, the value of c's, and that gives me the right um, integration normalization for the function. So now we want to calculate the average value. Now, of course, uh, you know, uh, on, on, on that formula, we know that the, the Gaussian on, on this distribution, the Gaussian is centered on zero, and there are as many negative x and positive x with the, same, with the same probability. So you expect the expectation value of this to be zero, right? This is where you expect the value to be on average. And indeed, if you do the integral, you find the integral indeed is equal to zero. Now, if we do the expectation value of x squared, you already know that it's not going to be zero, okay? Because x squared means that you only add positive numbers and some of those numbers are not zero. So the expectation value is certainly not zero. And in fact, if you do this calculation, once again, it looks complicated and this is where some students already give up. I, I know it's early to give up, but some students give up and say it's too complicated, but it's not. It's just simply the blind uh, application of the formula that we have for Gaussian. So we do that and we found that the expectation value, the square of the expectation value, uh, uh, the, so the average of the square, is, uh, is, is actually a square. And the a square is actually the value that we use in, uh, in, in, in the denominator for the argument of the exponential. So the Gaussian is like this. So we, know, we already know quite a few things with the Gaussian. Okay, so let's suppose now that we have done an experiment with a random variable, like let's say x, but you want to understand exactly uh, everything you learn from x, like the expectation value and so on, and you want to see what is, suppose that I'm using a function of x, what would be the statistical information I can get from a function of x? So in other words, in this slide, it's gonna be here. So suppose that I have x, which I measure as a random variable, and I want to create a new random variable y. And for that, uh, I'm giving you an example here, which is a very simple linear relationship, but it can be any relationship. So linear relationship me means that I need two uh, parameters, A and B, B being the shift and A being basically the scaling factor. And so you can calculate the expectation value of Y. And uh, you see very close quickly by applying the formula that the expectation value of Y will be A times expectation value of X plus B. It looks like something fairly trivial, but it's actually a very important result that we're going to use later, that knowing the expectation value of a random variable allows me to knowing the expectation value of a function of that variable. So that's an example of that here. Of course, we can do this for, uh, for we can talk now about the variance. So the variance is another concept that uh, I'm going to introduce to you. So the concept we've looked at so far is the expectation value. So, you know, the X between brackets, left, left and right bracket, left and right angle. Uh, the variance is going to be something slightly different. And uh, this is extremely important in statistical uh, mechanics. In fact, it's very important in statistics in general. So the variance answers this question. How far, from the, how far is a variable from the mean? So if you have a function that's very much centered around the mean, you have a small variance. If you have a very broad distribution, might have the same mean, same average, as the other function, but it's so broad that 
there's something different about it. So the, me- the way to measure this, the, the metric to measure this is the variance. So it's the deviation from the mean. So you could think that deviation from the mean would simply be this. This is my random variable minus the mean. Okay? So, nice. This is basically how far I am from the mean. Good. So what is that value on average? Right? That's what I'm interested in. On average, how far am I from the mean? Well, you know that if I simply use this above, this formula above, the expectation value of that thing from what I just demonstrated to you before, right? But the expectation value of a function of a random variable from the previous slide, I find that the expectation value of that distance from the mean is actually going to be equal to zero, right? So just if you're not convinced uh, for that formula, I use the formula from the previous slide where A is equal to 1 and B is equal to minus expectation value of X. And I find this equal to 0, of course, simply because on average, uh, <laughs> this is the kind of the definition of the average. On average, I am exactly on the average, <laughs> right, by definition. So therefore, if I look at all, how far I am on average from the average, I, I am on the average of 0. That's what it means. So maybe one thing that we need to do is to measure the distance from the, the average. So basically, maybe doing this. So the absolute value of that distance. The thing is that in math and physics and engineering in general, we do not lack absolute values. And the reason why we don't lack absolute values is because that function is, does not have a continuous uh, uh, derivative at the origin, right? You have kind of a cusp there. So we don't lack this. So instead, what we see all the time, and this, as I wrote there, is to keep mathematicians happy, we actually use the square of, the, of how far we are from the average, okay? So we do this simply because uh, square and uh, uh, are much easier to deal with than absolute value, that's in terms of, of uh, derivatives and so on and so forth. Okay, so the mean square deviation, of course, is gonna be given by the expectation value of that square, right? And then, of course, the the deviation of variance will be simply sigma x, which will be the square root of that, okay? So basically, we are going to end up with this formula here for the standard deviation. So how did I get there? Well, this is the function that I will need to use, and we, we call it variance, we call it standard deviation. So it means simply how far I am on average from the, av- from, on average, from the average. So this is a very important function that we use a lot of in statistical analysis. In fact, never, never believe uh, data that you obtain if people do not give you the standard deviation. If somebody, if you do an experiment and you do not know what the standard deviation, your, your experiment is essentially useless because you need to know how far, how, how, how good your experiment is uh, in this, okay? Okay. So let's go back to the linear transformation that I was mentioning before. So we've already discussed this when y is equal to ax plus b. And we've also discussed the average, the expectation value of y, and the expectation value of y squared. So this is something I did two slides ago to tell you on the transformation. Now we are ready to calculate the standard deviation of the new variable y, right? So the standard deviation, uh, we can show fairly easily that the expectation value uh, the, the standard deviation, sigma y, is going to be equal to a sigma x. And so how do you show that? Well, we show that by remembering the definition of sigma x we did on the previous slide and uh, applying the formula that I have up there on the slide. So you find that the expectation value, the standard deviation, is simply scaled by the same value as you scaled the function, the, the random variable to start with. Now. You may wonder why the value b does not, uh, does not come into the game for calculating sigma y. Well, it makes sense, right? If you take a full distribution and completely rigidly shift it by a value b, of course, the standard deviation does not change since everything moves in a rigid manner. So that's the reason why it doesn't matter. Okay, good. Um, Let's try to, to move on and uh, now talk about uh, independent variables. Okay, so now we are going to 
to continue with this, and uh, we are going to suppose that we have independent variables. So again, think about the random variables. Uh, again, sometimes students have trouble to understand what all this means, but think about you have a dice and you have a, you have a coin. So one random variable will be the number of dots that you find on the face of the dice, and the other one will be uh, if you have head or tail on the coin. Clearly, these two variables are independent variables. That would be two examples of this. Uh, the other example I put there on the slide is that, uh, for example, the, the quality of a favorite soccer team and the number of days you may you have to stay in confinement due to COVID-19. In principle, those two uh, variables are totally independent to one another. So, of course, we know, and this is something that I'm not going to insist too much today, but uh, we know that sometimes uh, there is a bias and the, what the sometimes variables that you that you consider independent and then use all the mathemat all the mathematics that goes along with independent variable it turns out they are not independent uh, and so this is of course like uh, it's almost the art of being a scientist is to be able to to find uh, variables that are truly independent and if they are not then understanding the the, the, the bias the, the cross talk between them but let's try to see a little bit how they, they use, the, the crosstalk works when we have purely independent variables. Suppose you have u and v, they are both independent variables, and we are going to use um, continuous variables. So therefore, we are talking about the probability that u is in the range u plus du and the probability that v is in the range v plus dv. Of course, it's given by the product of probabilities, right? When we, when we put probabilities together, we do the, the, do the product, OK? Uh, just to give you an example, when we look at the dice and the, and the head, what's the probability of having one dot on the dice and the head? This is the probability of having a, uh, one dot on the dice, so one six times the probability of having the head, so one half, so that's going to be one twelve. So it's really the, pro, the, the product of the two. So the average value of the product is, of course, um, the integral over all the possible values of u and v's times the value u and v, right? It's always the, the same thing. And of course, here we have two integral signs because we have to integrate over all the values u and all the values v. Because u and v are independent, and this is where the independence is translated into mass, so it's always kind of uh, very interesting to translate math into uh, English and the other way around, uh, because then things look so clear. Well, when you do that, you realize that the two integrals are independent, and you can separate u and v. And it turns out that the expectation value of the product is the product of the expectation values. So this is a very important result, that when you have two independent variables, the, in, the expectation value of the product is the product of the expectation value. It only works for independent variables. Uh, so the separation variable, as I said, only work because they are independent. Now, let's suppose that instead of having two independent variables, we have n of them. So, suppose you have n random variable and they have the same mean and variance sigma x squared. So, um, this is typical. The, the, let me give you an example. The example would be suppose that you do an experiment where you measure x and uh, Let's say it's an experiment where you measure the, the height of a person in the population, in the height in centimeters, let's say. Okay? Uh, if you repeat the experiment, you can imagine that each time you have a random variable xi, where i is the experiment number. So that means that uh, each of those variables, of course, have the same mean and the same variance. Now, suppose that you want to know you want to define a new random variable y, which is the sum of all those values that you measure. So first of all, the, the mean or expectation value of average, all synonymous of this, uh, you can look at the formula will be, of course, the expectation value of y will be the sum of the expectation value of each, uh, of each number, which is equal to n, so the number of variables times the expectation value of x. Why is that so? Well, remember what I said at the beginning of the slide. All those variables have the same mean. Okay. Now, the question you can ask yourself is, what's the variance of y, knowing that each of the variants of x are the same? 
Well, you just look at the formula on the right hand side and please take your time analyzing this. It's important. Uh, when you want to calculate the variance, we have to calculate the expectation value of the square and then the square of the expectation value. So the expectation value we, we already know, okay? That's what I wrote there, n times the expectation value of x. Now, if we want to calculate the expectation value of x square, uh, we see that what we need to do is the square of x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus all the way to xn. And of course, when we do that, we find that we do have x1 square, x2 square, all the way to xn square, plus all the, the dot product or the cross product. So this is, this is a quadratic uh, formula. So we only have two x's in each terms. Okay. So what we do, when we do that, we get the expectation value uh, of, the, of a sum, right? Of a sum of x square and x1, x2, and so on and so forth. So we can uh, uh, distribute, if you will, the, the expectation value, and you end up with uh, expectation value of product of, of a random variable x1, x2, x2, x1, x1, x3, and so on and so forth, right? So we know that we have n terms that looks like x square, right? And we, now we have to think about how many combinations can I make for, um, for x1 and another x. So I'm going to have x1, x2, x1, x3, x1, x4, and so forth, so on and so forth. And of course, I have n terms times n minus 1. So n is the, to is the, number, is the number of possibility for the first variable, and n minus 1 is the uh, probability for the second variable. Of course, it's not n squared since I already calculated the x1 square and x2 square and so on and so forth before. Okay, so of course those those terms uh, will uh, give me uh, the expectation value of a product. But remember, expectation value of the product of independent variable is equal to the product of the expectation value. So I get x squared as well. So at the end of the day, the expectation value of y squared is going to be given by the formula on the right hand side of this slide. Okay, so n terms plus n times n minus one term. So that's very nice. That's very nice because now I'm in a position to calculate the sigma y square. Sigma so y square, of course, is given by uh, the, the difference between the expectation value of y square minus square of the expectation value of y. I can just now plug in the values I just calculated for those two uh, numbers. And I find that the variance for sigma, so sig for y, sorry, the, 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 the variance for y, so sigma y square, is going to be given by n times sigma x square. So that's, uh, that's actually quite interesting because we were dealing with quadratic functions, sigma square, sigma, sigma y square, sigma x square, but the number that we get is n. Yeah, so you would you could have thought that maybe you could have had n square, but it's n. It's correct. It's n. So why is that important? Well, that's what we are going to do for the rest of this lecture. We're going to think about why this is important. And uh, the first, and now we, I'm going to talk about two examples. The first example is the consequence of this on measurements. So remember that uh, y. Uh, is the sum of the random variable x when we do we perform n measurement, n, n measurement of, of, of the random variable x, okay? So suppose now uh, that we are interested in, in the, x, in the uh, uh, variance of the measurement of, of y, which is the sum of the x's, right? So, so that's what we are going to do. We are measuring things n times. And of course, we have an independent error, which is sigma x. It's what we said at the beginning of, the, of, of, this, of, of this section. And so what's interesting about this, of course, is that what we usually do when we do a measurement, we calculate, we make a measurement multiple times of the same values, and we take this average, right? So basically we sum all the x's and we divide by n. And then we say, we feel confident. We have the intuition that the accuracy of the average is gonna be much better than the accuracy of any of the experiment, right? That's, that's typical. That's what we know intuitively. What this, this here shows it that's true. So if I'm interested in the 
sigma xi divided by n, we know that for the sum of xi, okay, the, sorry, not sigma xi, sum of xi divided by n, but we know that the, um, the variance for the sum of xi is sigma y, okay? Now, if I divide by n, remember, uh, I also uh, scale the variance the same way. So basically, I, the, the real variance that I get for the sum of xi over n is the variance of y divided by n, okay? The variance of y, sigma y, is square root n sigma x, right? Therefore, the, the variance of the sum of xi over n is going to be equal to sigma x divided by square root n. And this is the reason why, this, is, this formula is the reason why we perform the same experiment many times and get the, expect, the, the average. Indeed, now the variance actually goes down as one over square root n. In fact, if n goes to infinity, we know that there will be, the variance will be zero. In other words, the accuracy of my measurement is getting better and better, okay? As square root n. Doesn't go better, it doesn't get better very quickly. I mean, square root n is not a very fast, uh, fast function, but it systematically goes better as you increase the number of points. So all this is extremely important in statistical, uh, in statistics in general, in statistical physics in particular. Okay. Now let's have a look at another example, and this is going to be the random walk, and we will finish this lecture on this. Random walk is a, a beautiful example of of something we use a lot in in physics, in a, in Monte Carlo methods, for example, in computational physics, but also in the Brownian physics. Where we'll go to the Brownian motion later. A random walk basically means that uh, it comes from this. It, uh, it, it means, and I'm going to explain to you where the random walk comes. You have to imagine a drunken person, and the drunken person is just is drunk, of course. That's why we call it drunken person. It's moving out of a pub, and that person, and maybe you can think of something you've seen yourself, uh, is attempting to walk. In a street, in a, in a let's suppose in one-dimensional street, okay? usually they're one-dimensional. Um, okay, so the point is that that person is so drunk that the probability to go one step forward or one step backward is about is essentially the same. And each time that drunken person has moved one step, the next step is also either forward or backward. Okay. And there is absolutely no memory of what the previous step was. So that is really a very drunken person. So this is the idea, okay? So this is, this is what's summarized in the text there. So clearly, on average, on average, that person is not moving at all, right? Because there's as many possibilities to go forward one step than backward one step. Think a little bit about tossing a coin at each step. On average, of as many heads as you have tails. So basically, the expectation value of that movement is zero, okay? Now, what you're interested in is to know maybe there is a probability that that random walker is going to move a certain distance. So how far does that drunken person get from the pub uh, during such, such an event, right? So on average, you know it's zero, but maybe what you know is the extent of the distribution of x, the, the extent of distribution number of steps. And of course, that is exactly what I discussed. This is going to be the sum of xi, okay? So you get zero, so the, 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 the total distance is this. But what is interesting is, of course, the, um, the, the root mean, mean square of this. So basically the variance related to the variance. So what we see here, is that uh, the variance, just like before, uh, is actually going to increase by square root n, right? That's what we did on the previous slide. So we have basically the larger the number of steps, the longer the square of the distance, the, the, the square root of the square of the distance, if you will, or the total distance, the sum of the total distance, uh, increases by square root n. So essentially what happens in that case is that you see that, that that person might get a chance to get back home. And so if somebody sees the drunken person, you say, okay, come back in. So if that, that's like large enough. But instead of moving 
if n as a non-drunken person would do, right? The number of steps would be n times times x. That distance only increases as square root n. Okay, so that's that's the idea. That's the idea behind behind all this. So um, that's that 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 works that works really well for this. So this is the the, the random walk, and uh, that also uh, describes a number of things that we, we can actually measure, especially in uh, information technology. Okay, so now that we're done with this section on on those uh, on those um, random variable, uh, let's have a look at uh, another important distribution. So the, the probability distribution that we discussed, and it's called uh, the binomial uh, distribution. It's a very important one. Uh, we are going to talk about Bernoulli uh, trial. Uh, there is there are books written on Bernoulli trials, and, and this is fascinating. Today, I'm just going to give you a very short summary of what's important to us. So basically, a Bernoulli trial is like this. It's and this describes a lot of things actually uh, in the real world. The idea is like this: you do an experiment, and there are only two possible outcomes. One is probability p. Let's call it success. One is the probability one minus p, which is failure. Of course, my one minus p is imposed by the fact that if it's a it's a true probability distribution, the sum of all the probabilities is equal to one. Remember that was the first thing. So now that we have a distribution, we have to ask ourselves the usual question, always the same thing: what's the expectation value? Okay. And the second, what is the expectation value of the square? And finally, what's the uh, variance? So you just apply the formula that we've discussed so far, and uh, the expectation value of, of uh, the random variable will be, let's say, and here, here uh, we are, I didn't write this in the, on the slide, but what it says is the two possible outcomes is either one for success and zero for failure. Okay, that's, that's the way we decide to do it. So that means that the um, average value, the expectation value, will be zero times the probability of having zero, which is one minus p, plus one times the probability of, of having success, which is p. So the total is p. So the expectation value will be p. Expectation value of x squared like, uh, will also be equal to p. I mean, I let you do this as an exercise. And finally, you can calculate sigma x, which is the variance, which is, of course, the square root of x uh, expectation of x squared minus the, the square of the expectation value, and you find that the variance is square root p to multiply by 1 minus p. So this is called a, a Bernoulli trial, okay? And so now that we have this Bernoulli trial, we are going to look at a, a binomial distribution itself. So what's in the red box there is a definition. The binomial distribution is the discrete probability distribution p and k of getting k successes from n independent Bernoulli trials. So, uh, again, easiest thing to understand this is to take an example. So, you know that a given Bernoulli trial, you have probability p of success, one minus p, one minus p of failure. And the question is, you are told that uh, you can play the game, play that game, right, n times. And what you want to do is What's the probability that if I do it n times, k of those n times will be successful? Okay, this is what the binomial distribution says. So of course, uh, it depends what you are trying to, to do, of course, but it's very important to know what's the, pro what's, what's the probability that k of those successes, or k, k of those trials will be successes. So that's actually fairly easy to calculate. The question is, what is that probability? Well, first of all, the probability of, of having k success and, of course, n minus k, n minus k failure, right, because you can only have success or failure, will be probability p to the power k, right, so because you have k success, so p times p times p times p k times, multiply by the probability of, not, of no success, which is 1 minus p to the power n minus k. So that's nice, okay? So you have k successes of n minus k failures with an s that was lost in the slide, okay? So this is not enough though, because you know that 
each of those possibilities is as a probability, but if there is a possibility, there is more than one chance to get a k successes and n minus k failures. So how many possibilities are there to find k successes among n trials? Well, this is this goes back to goes back to the uh, combinatorics that we did in lecture one, and of course that that those possibility is c k n, so n factorial divided by n minus k factorial divided by k factorial. So we need that term. We need that term for the total probability because even though we know the probability of each event, some of the events are going to to give me the same answer. Basically, the answer being k success for n independent ordinary trials. So this is going to be, this is a very important function. This is the binomial distribution that we have right there. It looks a little bit complicated when, if you have not, if you don't remember where it comes from, but if you build it step by step, there's nothing really complicated in there. Now, remember that what we're interested in is to know that it's a proper uh, distribution, and I believe we, we build it correctly, but uh, one, one good uh, uh, check is to make sure that uh, the sum of all the probabilities will be equal to one. So let's do that. So this is very simple algebra uh, that you've done before. And you remember basically that uh, the formula for the x plus y to the power n, and uh, if you are into this, uh, uh, you have to look at the Pascal triangle. This is where we have we, we introduce these kind of things, but this is outside of the scope of this course. But the point is that the polynomial can be written in terms of the combinatorics CKN. This is where the Pascal triangle comes into the into into the game. And then you see, of course, if you remember that formula, if you say that x equal to uh, to p and y is equal to one minus p, x plus uh, so p plus 1 minus p is equal to 1, so the left-hand side is 1. And the right-hand side is exactly my binomial distribution. So that proves that the binomial distribution is indeed uh, properly normalized. Nice. Now that we have this, same, same study as, as always, we check that the distribution is normalized. Now we are going to check that the average, what the average is, and then we are going to check what the variance is. So... The, uh, because the binomial distribution is the sum of independent Bernoulli trials, remember that? This is exactly what we did. We just sum over all the possible Bernoulli trials. We know that we know the formula for this. We, the expectation value simply scale as the number of experiments. So go back a few slides to see that. So basically the expectation value of, of, of k, so the expectation value of finding k successes among n experiments will be equal to n times, times p, where p is the probability of, a, of an individual success. Uh, likewise, you can use the same formula as before to find that the variance of k, the, so the square of the variance, sigma k square, is equal to np times 1 minus p. And one more time, you just apply the formula that we saw for independent uh, variable. Now, what usually people like to do is to divide, is to actually look at the fractional width, which is basically a normalization factor. By uh, normalizing the uh, variance sigma k by the expectation value, okay? And when you do that, that allows you to have all the expectation values uh, essentially uh, centered at, at a given point, which is p, right, when you divide uh, k by n. And you end up with the distribution that's plotted there on, uh, on in, the, in, the, in the curve. So you have the different curves depending on how many values of n you are, you, you are using, so how many trials you are you're doing. So what you see is that the variance um, actually goes down as, again as 1 over square root n, so the more trials you do, the more uh, sharp the distribution becomes. Makes sense, right? Uh, and then at the same time, the, all, the distribution is always centered on, on NP. But here, we are not plotting as a function of K. We are plotting as a function of K over N. Therefore, it's always centered at P. 
okay, which is 0 0.4 in this case. So you may wonder, oh, hold on a second, how comes that uh, it's normalized? Because clearly these are not, don't have the same surface under the curve. But remember, these are renormalized each time so that the maximum value of distribution is at one. Okay, so this is, uh, you have to check the, the y-axis. The y-axis we divide by the maximum value of distribution so that we can plot all those functions on the same graph with the same scale. So this is a very important distribution. This is a, a Bernoulli trials. This is a very, very uh, um, widespread methods to do statistics and to understand the, 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 the variance. So of course here, what we want to do uh, is to increase the number of number N so that uh, we reduce basically the spread of the data and we get, uh, we get more and more confidence about the data and the averages that we get. So an example of this is of course a fair coin. A fair coin means that you have a coin and you have 50% chance to be uh, to land on head and 50% to land on tail. Uh, so probability, of course, of the Bernoulli trial is 0 0.5. And suppose you do it 16 times. So you take your coins and you, you, you use it 16 times. Uh, I mean, you check 16 times if it's head or tail. And of course, the number of the, the, the expected number of, of heads, if n is equal to 16, is we already know it's 8. Well, if we use the formula from the previous slide, Expectation values n times p, it's indeed 8. So we are very happy. Standard deviation, we use also the formula from the previous slide. And the uh, standard deviation is of 2. So 2 is fairly large when you think about it, because your value was 8. So you, have, you, uh, you, know that, uh, you know that the expectation value is 8. But in fact, with so few trials, you could get lucky and get something much larger than 8, all the way to 10, for example. Or Unlucky, so you can get to six. So this is exactly how um, uh, you use with with those uh, casinos. Casinos always expect you to, uh, to 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 lose. Now, of course, there is also a bias. It's not it's not a fair coin. Uh, there is always a, a reason. It's always slightly less than zero point five, of course, uh, so that it's always the, they always win on average. Otherwise, they would not exist, of course. But the point is that if you were playing forever. Uh, you will not have such a strong deviation, and of course you would have no you would have no deviation means that you will not gain anything. So let's try to have a look. Suppose that now n is 10 to the power 20, so it's almost the Avogadro number, very large. So the expectation number of heads is again n times p, so basically 10 to the power 20 divided by by 2. Okay, all right. So this is exactly half of them are number of heads. And the standard standard deviation now is 5, 10 to the power 9. And uh, uh, this comes from the square root of p times 1 minus p divided by n, that, as we showed in the previous slide. So you can say, oh, this is a huge standard deviation, isn't it? Well, it is large. But in fact, in relative terms, it's much smaller than before. OK? Because you expect to have 10 to the power 19 heads. and plus or minus 10 to the power 9. So it's a very small fraction of the expectation value that you can get away from. So the, the best way to plot this, to do this, is to plot this on a the, on the, on the graph. So this is the first experiment where you have 16 trial, trials. The expectation value is 8. And you go between 10 and 6, right? This is the, the, the standard deviation of 2. But now if you do the experiment with 10 to the power 20, uh, you find the expectation value of number of heads is 5 to the power 10 to the power 9, but the spread is tiny, it's 10 to the power 9. And even here on this slide, uh, this little uh, green uh, rectangle is way, way, way larger than it should actually be, but it's, this is for illustration purposes. All right, so let's go back to the random walk um, again in one dimension and try to think about the random walk now, in terms of the binomial distribution, and this is going to be the last slide of this lecture. So a random walk is like, think about the drunken man at each step. OK, at each step, the drunken man says, should I go forward or backward? The level of alcohol in his blood means that the probability of going forward or backward is the same, is 0 0.5. OK, uh, we are not counting here the probability of sitting on the ground. The drunken man is moving, really, OK? So the probability is p is equal to 0 0.5. And he's going to 
uh, do n steps. So what's the probability now that 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 drunken man is going to move a certain total number of steps? Okay. So suppose that there is k, there are k step forward and and n minus k k step backward. So the the distance traveled is of course uh, k forward means k times plus plus the distance that travels so it's plus l plus the rest so n minus k which is then backward minus l. So the total uh, the 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 random variable now becomes two k minus n multiplied by l. Okay. So of course again the mean distance as we know is going to be the same as we had before, all right, which is, uh, I mean, the same as the, the, this is going to be the mean of of the of the of x, which is of course going to be given by the mean of two k. Uh, the minus n does not does not contribute because it's just a rigid shift times l, which is of course uh, just a, a scaling factor. So we see that the mean distance in that case. Okay. When you do this, that kind of experiment, the, on average, the mean distance is going to be twice the expectation value of k, but the expectation value of k is zero. Okay, the expectation value of 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 k is is uh, is zero. Right? Remember that's that's what we we discussed uh, before, where you go either forward or backward. So basically, what means that the mean distance in that case will be zero, just like we said before. Now, you can, what's important is to calculate the standard deviation and one more time. The standard deviation shows that, uh, that, that the, the, the spread of, of the walk, if you will, is square root n times n. So if you do, do a drunken man, is, you are going to see that the excursion is going to be, on average, is not going to go anywhere from where it started at the pub but the excursion is going to extend all the way to square root n times n, okay? So that's, that's basically what we do here. So I just spent uh, this time to uh, summarizing, summarizing these probabilities, and uh, this is pretty dense, okay? I, I hope that you've heard about some of this material before because this is, of course, pretty dense. We usually spend a little bit more time than, than 40 minutes or so on that kind of things. So, um, it is strongly recommended to do as many as the problem in the back of this chapter as possible, so to get uh, familiar with this. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, in the next lecture, we'll discuss about temperature and the Boltzmann factor. So we'll go really uh, uh, full gear into thermodynamics. Thank you very much.